Well, welcome everyone to the uh, community night. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and, and talk about one of our favorite subjects. Um, so we're going to talk about Java and the machine and how the world is changing from under your feet. In fact, it has been changing for a very long time. And uh, hopefully we're going to help give you guys a, a, bit of a bit of a warning about it, really. Warning? Well, maybe. We'll just, okay. we'll just try and scare you, really. Um, so I'm Martin. Um, yeah, I help run the LJC. Um, everything else you can find out from Google. I'm Kirk. And you can find out everything from Google. You can find Google everything right else you want from Google. And so the problem we have today is that this guy is coming after you, right? Everyone here seen the Terminator films? All right. Excellent. I've never seen the Terminator film. You never? <sighs> never. We're, we're, we're That's why I was looking at this thing going, like, what the heck is that thing anyway? <laughs> It's something Arnie does, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, as you probably know, uh, humans don't tend to do very well against this guy, and that's pretty much going to be the theme of this talk. And us as developers aren't doing terribly well against the hardware that faces us today, and it's only getting worse. Right, so what do we have here? This is a brand new Core i7 schematic, as, uh, as you can see, and um, in, in all its brilliance, that's what we face. What the hell? Oh, hey, Martin, do you know what this is? Uh, Does anybody know what this is? Was anyone here born before 1975? <laughs> Russell at the back, do you know what this is? Anybody know what this is? Oh, wow, Whoa, look at that. Hey, someone hey, at the yeah, front right. of the hardware geek here. Yes. We have a hardware geek here, right? This is the first microprocessor that Intel shipped in 1971. This is a 4,000, yeah, and four. Right? And uh, right, uh, so I mean, this is what it looked like uh, when it was uh, basically in chip form. And uh, you could, yeah, it looks like this little ant thing here, right? And, and look at this thing, right? It blazed along somewhere between 108 kilohertz to, was it 740 kilohertz? Oh, the processing power you would ever need. Right, exactly. 16 Beautiful. pin dip, 2,300 transistors. Isn't that fantastic? And, and if you look at this, right, instruction cycles of, you know, somewhere between 10.8 or 21.6 uh, microseconds, right? And you needed eight of these in order to get an instruction executed, and they were all done sequentially. It's a beautiful chip, isn't it? Four-bit, right? Eight-bit, four-bit, four eight bit. instructions. Wow. Who here has coded 16-bit? Eight-bit. Russell, still four-bit. Four <laughs> yes. Yes, Two people really. Oh, not me. Right? No. Okay. Wow. Okay. So, cool. and, and and if you contrast that to this guy here, yeah. right? So, you know, what are we looking at here? The, I mean, these are the landings. All of the landings for uh, the i7. There's like 1,370 of them. And as you can see, we've completely run out of edge space on this on this particular chip. So we 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 simply can't get any more input or output on this particular chip. And and if you look at it, right? Uh, we go to 3.3 gig, uh, gigahertz, so that's a speed up of 42, 4,200 times. And actually, if you look at the transistor count, right, 774 million transistors on this thing. So that's like an increase. That can make even my code run fast, I think. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and we got uh, like full pipelines here, which means our instructions are now retired at one per clock under ideal conditions. And, but we do have this really strange thing that we have to worry about, right? Since everything's happening in a pipe, we have to worry about these things that are which are called adjacent instructions and nearly adjacent instructions, um, which means that things are happening uh, probably before you know they should be happening or uh, maybe shouldn't be happening at all or, or happening uh, without, uh, without the data that they need in order to complete or all of these other like weird conditions that, we, that you basically have to deal with, right? If you ever, ever want to go to sleep, either read the generic specification in Java, the Java language specification, or go read one of the Intel manuals on the specific registers that you have for a CPU. Right. And they're up to 7,000 pages plus. And if Richard's Other, in the room, he can well tell you that. all about that. Well over that, right? Yeah. I mean, the packaging document was 102 pages. The entire instruction set on the, uh, on the 4004 could be described in basically a single page. So right. as you can see, we went <clears throat> from some pretty simplistic hardware to something that's so ridiculously complex that it takes, you know, 
7,000 pages to describe just some of its features. Yeah, not even all of them, just <clears throat> one of them. There's, um, excuse me, <clears throat> I got a beer in my throat or something. Um, so it, not, and that's just one of the features, which is not even actually core to the processing. That's just part of it. The, the, there's all these thermal things and all, and sorts of other exciting all, bits all and kinds pieces. of other things that, that are just come on top of the actual processing capabilities. So we've got lots of challenges. And we're going to cover a range of these challenges today. I'm going to take you through some of the basics, talk, talk a little bit about hardware threads, virtualization, the JVM, a little bit of Java itself, and then by the time you've all fallen asleep, we'll try and wrap up so you can have another beer. Well, we didn't actually get to the point of putting in the how to do pointer arithmetic in Java. Yeah. Has anyone actually had to do pointer arithmetic in Java? None. No, wow. one's, no one's been brave enough. Does so, anyone actually realize you can do pointer arithmetic in Java? Oh, we should have put that in. Told you. We should have. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Quite fun. Look up the unsafe class. It's really <laughs> yeah. fun. Really cool. We'll, we'll cover that a little bit later. Okay. Back to basics? Yep. Let's go back to basics. So here are the basics we're going to cover. A few, a few simple laws that I'm hoping everyone kind of remembers. Maybe, maybe not, but if not, we'll go over. Oh, and my favorite one, the fourth one. Yeah. It's, it's Kirk's, Kirk's law. It's the right. hardware stupid. Right, exactly. On to number one. Has everyone seen Moore's law? Yeah, are we all sick and tired of seeing it on, on slide decks and stuff? Yeah. Does anyone not know what Moore's law is? Right, they're bored. Move on. Jim, get out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, if you don't know what Moore's law is, then this, the rest of this talk is going to go very, very badly for you. <laughs> All right, so we know what Moore's law is. It's all to do with the number of transistors. Boring. And, and it used to be that everyone said, oh, it's about clock speeds are doubling, but that really wasn't it. It was really about transistors. And once we got enough transistors on a chip that we actually couldn't get a clock to all of them, um, then we had a problem, right? And that's when things really started uh, changing. And changing the for the worse for us. Yeah. Life just got harder and harder. So we've got little little law here, and we've got a nice little bunch of mathematical symbols, which are pretty darn meaningless, really. Um, um, do you know what they mean, Kurt? Yeah, I have some idea. We have a lambda and a, and a mu. Those are the Greek things, right? Um, so really, I think this is uh, the biggest challenge that we all face. I mean, everybody looks at, uh, at uh, <clears throat> with the Amdahl's law, but in my humble opinion, this is the one that we all face all the time. It really says that throughput in our application is one over service time. So if we look at this, you know, so what does this mean to us, right? It's like every time we face a point of serialization in our code, right, where all of the threads um, have to pass through this point of serialization, we run straight into that, right? And this is a thing that's actually going to limit, um, you know, the throughput on our application. And this is the thing that we actually uh, need to fight against. Right? So if we look at what we have in Java that actually forces us through this particular formula, it's synchronization. Synchronization. Yeah, yep. right? So, you know. Memory uh, barriers, fences? Yeah, stuff. things like that. Now, and you could, we used to play some funny games with this up until 2005 because, you know, we would look at, uh, you know, how fast clock speeds were increasing. We'd say, okay, we need so much throughput in the system. Um, and then we'd build a system with the idea that the clock speed would actually get uh, faster, which means the instructions would execute, you know, uh, quicker, which means that the service time for any critical section in our piece of code would get, you know, time-wise smaller, which means our throughput went up. We didn't have to do anything, right? And you uh, We used to call this the quake principle. The quake principle, yeah. You never heard of the, the quake principle? The quake gaming? Yeah, you know, yeah. quake, yeah, yeah, okay. So, you know, you go, you know, uh, you go out and you get the requirements and you say how fast it has to be, right? And you do the calculations, you say, okay, no problem, I can deliver that in 18 months. You go back in your cube, you play quake, yeah. right? And you 15 months later, you come out and say, order this hardware, job done, right? We don't have to do anything mm. as developers. <laughs> Off we go. And you, you will have experienced this out in the bar just before, right? You know, the person who was serving was serving faster and faster and faster, but at some point, the clock speed of him or her pulling those pints just stopped dead, right? Well, that had to do with the pathetically slow uh, flow rate of the beer coming out of, the, out of those little tiny taps. Yeah, terribly disappointing. Right, exactly. Feedback for Jack's London there, if you're listening. <laughs> yeah. 
Good. Okay. One more law. Should we go for one more? Uh, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, Absolutely. Right. Endel's law. Is it people, people run across this one recently? Okay. There's a few variations on it, but what it's fundamentally saying is how many bits of your algorithm or how many bits of your system can you actually run in parallel until you hit this bottleneck of serialization? Right? So out in the bar, if we had had an extra four or five servers, we could have formed another four or five queues, which would have allowed us to parallelize that particular algorithm. But at some point, there would have been a serial bottleneck anyway. Mm. You think so? Or I could be completely wrong, because I'm a bluffer. <laughs> Good. It could be. Yeah, so, so basically what it's saying is the percentage of serialization in our code is going to limit the number of cores that we have. And if we know what the percentage of serialization is in our code, um, then we can actually predict how well we're actually going to scale across cores. And um, Little's law actually nicely feeds into this because that gives us uh, an idea of how much serialization there is in our code. Right? And there's a few assumptions made in this particular formula, like as in everything is perfectly serializable and through across blocks, which obviously isn't true. But it does give us a rough estimate as to what we can theoretically achieve. So this is the type of stuff, the type of formula you want to apply if, if your boss says, ooh, if we can buy that new shiny 64 core box, everything will be OK, right? <laughs> well, maybe not. Yeah, we have war stories, actually, where somebody came to me and said, we need to buy a couple of more servers. And I looked at them and I said, you can't even use one. Why do you want to buy more? <laughs> you, you need to go fix the bugs in the architecture that are actually preventing you from you even you, you know, basically only fully utilizing a single core. Yep. And, and you know, we, we talk about garbage collection later. Yeah, we do. Right. Once Anybody left. remember like, uh, you know, 117, 118, uh, 112? Oh, we got somebody up front here that does, right? Serial garbage collection, right? You have a 64-way box. All of a sudden, the garbage collector kicks in. 63 cores go quiet. One is working, you know, working, you know, beavering away, fixing up things, and then, you know, perfectly serialized. Yep. Nice bottleneck, wasn't it? Absolutely. So that brings us on to, well, I guess informally, Kirk's law, and that's it's it's all about the hardware. And the hardware is something that I think certainly as Java developers, or as a lot of developers, haven't really had to think about for a very long time. Because as Kirk alluded to before with the Quake principle, is that hardware was speeding up so much that you just didn't have to worry about it. Because all you had to do was wait for a little bit, and the hardware would give you the performance benefits literally out of the box, just like they promised in the marketing materials. Right. Um, but the CPU isn't the only thing that we have to worry about. We have to worry about just about every other resource on the computer, because they're all shared by everything that's running on our computer. And, and they all have finite capacities. They all have finite throughputs. We can only use, um, we only have so much bandwidth, right? And we only have so much volume that we can actually deal with on any piece of hardware. And if we consume that, or if we even have one application consume the majority of that particular bandwidth, then anybody using that particular resource is going to be bottlenecked in the exact same way as that, that, process, that process that's consuming the hardware would be bottlenecked, even though they may only be using a little bit of it. Um, so in this case, we really have to look at things from a very, very hardware-specific uh, uh, you know, point of view. Uh, to understand what's actually bottlenecking our applications. And, and we'll touch upon this again a little bit when we come to a, the virtualization section, right? Because all of these lovely VMs are still interacting with the same physical piece of limited resource you've got. Okay? It doesn't magic up more CPU for you. It doesn't magic up more RAM for you. We, we wish it would, but it just doesn't. So, um, those of, oh yeah, I like, I like this term. This is a great quote. Sympathy. Yeah. Um, because this, this really, sorry, I'm going to steal the slide from you here. Go for it. Because uh, th this really, you know, I'm, we've been talking to people in the industry uh, for um, I don't know how many years. And, and this all comes back to my work with, uh, even with the prior, you know, prior to Java with Cray Supercomputers and things like that. We worked really hard to make sure that our applications blended well with the, uh, with the hardware. So we would look at the hardware, we'd understand the hardware, and we actually adapted our coding style so that it would actually fit with the hardware very well. Because that's, we knew when we did that, we actually got the best performance out of the, out of the hardware, right? 
But until you know, Martin Thompson sort of coined this nice thing like mechanical sympathy, it didn't really have what I would consider to be a, a good way of describing this, you know, this activity that we did on a daily basis when we were working with supercomputers. Yeah. And what I find is that even when you're working with Java, you sort of need to still want to understand where this thing is going to be deployed in and, and what, what's going on inside the JVM so that you can, you can help your application perform better by uh, trying to do things that fit with what is, is there. So you can, you can utilize those uh, particular resources as, as well as you can. And you know, I've always equated this to uh, a problem of economics, right? It's we have scarce resources, we want to utilize them and maximize, you know, get maximal utilization out of them. And in order to do that, we're, we're going to have to do some optimization that takes those resources into consideration, or the quantities of them anyway. Do, do we have people here in the low latency space? You want to do low latency stuff? One or two people? Okay. So pe people in the low latency space, for example, will do really careful things like ensuring that, their da that the data they're sending across a network fits in perfectly with the size of a network packet. Right? They'll make sure that when they're writing to disk, that the data they write to a disk fits in perfectly with a disk sector. It's these sorts of thoughts that they go through for their mechanical sympathy, which allows them to get extreme performance. Well, and, and even when they write data in, into arrays and stuff like that, they consider the size of the cache that they're writing to. So they, right. they know that if they write to ex precisely the size of the cache, that they're going to take a huge performance hit. So they want to try to make things fit into smaller spaces so that they uh, you know, get maximal performance out of the machine. All right, so what are, these, what are these poor people in the audience going to do? First of all, you saw some maths, don't panic. And, and, and also don't panic that this multi-core revolution and that this changing hardware is going to come along and ruin your lives and make you redundant, OK? The fundamental laws behind that govern all of this have been around for a very long time. Uh, if you ignore some of the scary Greek-looking letters, the mathematics is pretty simple. And you can simply learn the laws by actually writing small snippets of code which actually execute these laws for you. Now, that, that's how you best understand them as a developer, right? What else can we say? Understand the hardware that you've got. Okay? If, if you're not looking at your hardware manuals on your production servers, or you're not talking to your system administrators about how much RAM you've got, what type of RAM you've got, are your processors split across multiple sockets or not, these types of questions, you really need to start finding out now. Because the way that Java and the JVM and the operating system interacts with this hardware is incredibly important. So you need to start understanding the stuff again. Well, I, you know, in a specific war story, right? It's like um, I can ask a question, right? How many people know what their uh, write memory bandwidth is from their CPU to memory? Right? Whoa, we have one person here. Awesome, right? So we just took uh, we just took one application and did about in one round of tuning, somewhere between about a 30 to 40 percent performance improvement by just understanding that these guys were uh, like, you know, hitting that particular limit inside their application. And, um, you know, these, these poor guys were actually using execution profilers to try to figure out what's going on. And, of course, since they had the wrong measurement, they weren't getting anywhere. And it's only, only when we brought the right measurement to the table that they understood what the true bottleneck was in their application. And that's when we started making forward progress in this case. Case, right? So from their perspective, their application wasn't running as fast as they needed it to, to do, to, uh, to run, and they didn't know why, right? So we need proper measurements, we need measurements across all of the bits of hardware, and we need to understand what these throughputs and capacities are so we can do a proper comparison so that we can understand if we're hitting uh, limits inside the hardware. And, and don't forget even things like hard disks are now changing, right? The the amount of people that are moving to an SSD or an SSD hybrid, for example, is completely changing by an order of magnitude the characteristics of dealing with disk. Okay, so you need to start thinking about these things if you're going to make your applications performant and scalable. Yeah, and the disk is not the only thing that's changing. Every, everything is changing. <coughs> so hopefully after that little bit of math section and things that you're still with us. That was uh, math? Well, not really. Okay. So we're going to go on to some calculus next. And then the last section, we're going to have some assembly Stat programming. And statistics, there we go. And some statistics. All right, so That's is, everyone, is everyone, everyone still got a beer in their hand? Okay. Okay. <laughs>
Yeah, right. When you, when you get the assembler, you're on your own. Yeah, I'm on my own, yeah. So the next thing we kind of want to talk about really is, is, is threads. Uh, and threads are really interesting little creatures because as far as hardware is concerned, it doesn't really know about them. Yeah, hardware has no concept of process, has no concept of threading, right? Where's yep. our quote? Uh, it's going to come up a little bit. So we'll start with this one first. Right. Threads seem to be a small step from sequential, uh, seem to be a small, you want to read that? Because I can't. Oh, they can read, they can read <laughs> it themselves. Seem right, a small so. Small step from sequential computation. In fact, they represent a huge step, right? And, and I think the emphasis here is like on the S on the end of the word thread there. Um, because thread is a fantastic abstraction. And it really does help us with this idea of sequential computing, right? It, it helps us understand how things are progressing uh, through time. Uh, but you know, t in that case, it's, you know, that abstraction is our friend because it helps us deal with time. But as soon as you pluralize that, then you have a whole different problem because now you have a messy world where a lot of things are happening all at the same time. In reality, we, we, in past architectures, we weren't used to this. And we still very, very much think sequentially, and our programming languages force us to think sequentially. And uh, because of that, we're having, a, you know, I think, a very difficult time transitioning to this idea where we have a lot of things happening all at the same time. Does anybody here have children? <laughs> Excellent. So when you have one child playing in a, in a, in a playpen or a play center, everything's hunky-dory, right? What happens when you throw in two, or four, or eight, or 16, or heaven forbid, 32 of them? Yeah. Right? This is exactly what it's like dealing with multiple threads. And it is very, very messy, very noisy, and it gets out of control really quickly, no matter how many parents or teachers or managers you have around that. So we'll go, we'll go, back, we'll go back to the beginning. And this was well before my time, so yeah. I'm going to let you cover this one. Yes, yeah, right. In the beginning, there was a fork, <laughs> and we loved it, right? All it did was take your process, make a copy of it. The second process is running independently. The first one, really cool. We don't have to worry about sharing, right? Oh, well, if we do have to worry about sharing, right, that gets incredibly hard, because there really isn't any good mechanism to share, okay? We, well, aside from files or things that look like files, like pipes, or things that look like files, like sockets, or, or shared memory, or, or something like this, right? But, but we had to define our own protocol to get these things uh, to work. But we didn't have any race conditions, right? Hardware caching was transparent. We didn't care about that, right? We could cache anything we wanted, anytime we wanted, no fears, no worries, right? Life was simpler. Ordering is guaranteed, you know, but why, then. Why did we ever change? But then, yes, <laughs> but then. So we're just going to, because we, we, we're, we're, we're trying to you know, evolve ourselves as speakers, and we, we found that uh, we, were we were copying some ideas of Trish and hand drawing stuff. Right. Um, but we're going to skip past that. Yeah. That's blatant plagiarism. Well, we'll go back. We'll go back. We'll go back. Don't worry. OK. Then we had multi thread, single core, right? So all of a sudden, you know, 90, early 90s, uh, people come up with POSIX threading. Well, you know, let's say it became kind of more main mainstream about that time. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, I mean, the funny thing was, uh, you know, you get um, people like Solaris. They all of a sudden had to support multiple threads, and they wanted to multi-thread their uh, operating system. You know how they managed to do that? No idea. I've never they, worked they, on they just, they just looked at it, right? And they said, crap, we haven't got a freaking clue how to multi-thread this thing, right? But it needs to be thread safe. So all we're going to do is put a big lock around the entire kernel. Yes. <laughs> And so that's what they did. So it's like and, putting and a synchronized keyword around the entire class. The, it, around the entire kernel, right? Awesome. And so it was really okay. cool. And, and it's really funny, because um, I was talking to a friend of ours, Heinz, mm -hmm. when he was in South Africa at a client. Mm -hmm. And he said, hey, we have this thread safe, or, well, thread unsafe library that we're using that's basically screwing everything up. And so how are we going to deal with that, right? I said, well, let's borrow the Solaris idea. We just put a synchronized wrapper around the entire library. He said, that won't scale. I said, you never know. Try it. And I said, what do you want? Do um, you want uh, the wrong answer quickly, or the right answer maybe slightly slower? Right? It, it put it around it, and it actually didn't have any impact on performance at all. But getting back to the Solaris thing, they could get away with a lot of things, because 
even though they went and started you know, peeling off multiple threads out of the core, um, out of the kernel, they were still on a single core. So again, we didn't really have to worry about flash, you know, flushing caches and trying to keep all of this stuff in sync and everything. It, it just sort of happened magically, to, you know, and we didn't have to worry about that. And therefore, we could program very loosely. And because everything was still happening sequentially, even though it looked like we had multiple threads, you know. They were just being shared. They were just being shared it all on, and, on and off a single core. Right? Yeah, it all worked. So it was really, yeah. really cool, <clears throat> right? And then if we go back to the section where we threw laws at you, Moore's law kicked in, right? And Kirk showed you that lovely diagram of the i7 die where we just ran out of space. Yeah, yeah. now we go back to now we, my now bad we, now we go back to, rendition uh, of uh, Trish tradition. draws way better than this, by the way. So go see her talk tomorrow. No offense. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, man. Um, so yeah, here we have a <laughs> lovely example of uh, a couple of cores on a CPU and its interaction with main memory and the caches that, that live with that. So. For each little core, you've got a nice little L1 cache, nice and fast, nice and close to the actual registers where the execution happens. Slightly larger L2 cache to hold that little bit of extra, somewhat slower data and instruction. And then you have the L3 cache, which some modern processors have to share information across a couple of cores on a, on a single physical CPU. And then you have to go all the way out to main memory, which is orders of magnitude slower, right? if you want to go share data across CPUs. So you th think, think about what that means in terms of having to share what is stored inside a variable, for example, right? You've got multiple threads wanting to read that data. Well, I, I, another point here is that we need to feed the hungry beast, right? Which is a CPU which is getting faster and faster and faster and faster. And we have memory, which is getting faster and faster and faster. But there's an 8% gap between how fast memory is getting and how fast the CPU is getting. So every year, CPUs are going like that, memory is getting. So what are we going to do? Well, somehow we got to get the data that we're using closer to the cores. So we're going to cache it, right? But as soon as we cache it, if all of a sudden our thread flips over to co from core one to core three, we got a problem. How are we going to get that? How are we going to know that you know that data over there can't be used and it's, it's got to be over here and you know, all of a sudden, you know, this, this whole picture gets really, really messy. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you go back to the, uh, the V8 Spark chip, right? Mm -hmm. They didn't have any instructions to actually deal with this. So there's no way in Java you could write a, uh, a thread safe application. Because as soon as a variable got hoisted into one of these registers, there's no way of programmatically saying, let's get it out of there, right? And then Scary all of a sudden, stuff. all of a sudden, Sun had to issue, uh, you know, uh, something that says, you know, you can't run multi-threaded Java on a V8 processor. You have to go to a V9 <laughs> to get it to work. Because by that time, they started putting in instructions to actually get the caches uh, to, to synchronize with each other and flush. Um, okay. Yeah, I want to go back to this, this one here. Right? I'm very proud of this So this one, yeah, this one I'm very proud of because Trish didn't actually draw one of these. <laughs> this, is, this is my own creation. And, and really what we're seeing here is, is, a, is an L1 cache, right? So the L1 cache is going to feed four channels into the CPU. And so we're going to have 64 bytes in each of these particular cache lines. We're going to have enough sets to fill out however big your L1 cache is. And you know, the, the, the expensive operation in all, in all of this is that if, if there's something in here that we recognize that we need to, that we can't cache and we need to, uh, to refresh the cache, right? Then Somehow we have to drain these things and refresh these from main, from main memory, and, and that can take a, a considerable amount of time right, to get done. Clock cycles and clock cycles and clock cycles. Clock cycles and clock cycles and clock cycles, yeah. yeah. So, you know, we see some applications, uh, we have some demonstrations that, you know, you basically get forward progress, a few clock cycles, and then you have to wait like uh, 150, 200 clock cycles for the cache to refresh, and then you go forward two or three cycles or five cycles or something like that again, and then you wait another 150, and then you go forward about tens, so it's 150. Not two steps forward and one step back. It's well, like two and steps forward and 150 back. And, then and, you know, and so you have this very powerful, like, uh, you know, two point whatever gigahertz machine that's spending about two gigahertz of their, its, its time basically doing nothing. Yep. Sad times. Okay, so I think we've covered most of the stuff in here. 
So now we've got the multiple hardware thread situation to the nice little multi-core diagram you saw before. As Kirk mentioned, using safety, so putting in memory fences and memory barriers and forcing stuff to be drained. Uh, we have volatile keyword, we have synchronized, we have some locks. We'll go into this a little bit further. There's a little bit of hardware and software support which kind of eases some of the pain, but it's, it's, it's really not there yet. There, there is no magic, magic bullet. Yeah. So, so we have this wonderful instruction here called a CAS. Does anyone know what a CAS is? I imagine the low latency guys have a good idea what a CAS is. There's a few people in here that actually know it. It's called a compare and swap. And so what, what we're basically saying is that um, I can have two hardware threads trying to update the same value in memory and um, at the same time. So what happens is that they have to go in understanding what the value is. So they're going to say, I think there's a one in there. I need it to be a two. And maybe the other guy's going to come in and says, well, I think there's a one in there. And I need, you know, I need this to be a, a three as an example. Well, whichever thread arrives first, he's going to win this particular race and he's going to be able to update the value. The second guy in is going to experience like a CAS failure, right? So we can have two hardware threads actually trying to update the same values at the same time. And um, the hardware itself is going to work out, you know, which thread is actually going to be able to be successful. Um, now, we use this feature in Java, but uh, as we mentioned before, you have to use this class unsafe in order to do it. And you have to do pointer arithmetic in Java in order to be able to do it. And um, so to actually open this up in your JVM is a huge security hole because once I can do pointer arithmetic, then of course I'm in the world of C++, which means I can do all Anything kinds of things. Like, yeah, we were trying to actually in an applet knock out the uh, security manager to see if we could uh, to, to deal with that. Um, fortunately, CAS is not allowed in an applet, so. Yeah, so um, the class is called unsafe for a reason. <laughs> yes. So yeah, what do I, we do? We gotta get to the pointers at some point in time. We gotta right? get to at some point in time. Absolutely. So what is it you can do, right? So Oh, we missed on Numa. We missed on Numa. But you wanna talk about Numa? No. We can skip okay. we can skip we'll, we'll skip cover Numa. Numa again later. We'll talk about Numa. Okay, right. so what can we do? Uh, this is a quote from Gil from his all systems. Some of you might have heard of him. He's he's sort of mainly responsible for the Zing garbage collector amongst other things. So he, he said that we try and protect code with the hope of the protecting the data. Right, because we've got this shared, shared data now. And here within caches. lies the problem. Here lies the problem. Right. We're not protecting data. We're protecting code. Mm -hmm. What we really want to do is protect the data, which means that if we mess up in the code, we mess up in protecting our data. Yeah. Right. Um, we get corrupt that's, data and that's bad. So we've got a whole bunch of things we can do in Java to help us protect. Um, some of them are pretty low level, some of them are like larger wrappers around things. Hopefully some of them are familiar to you. But all of them have a fairly large performance hit. And we're going to go a rapid action through a bunch of code slides shortly to show you exactly how that works. But what they all do is they all put these memory barriers in place, they all put these fences in place. You know, point, points of safety which says, if I want to go get this value, I need to make sure that it is flushed out of the caches back into main memory so I can go grab it. That's usually the common scenario. So we've got a nice example of a fence here that was atomic until something <laughs> happened. Something happened? Well, that's on the San Andreas fault directly. So what happened was that the ground shifted and actually, right? It's a, this fence was once atomic. <laughs> okay. It is no more. So we've got a bunch of source codes. You can read it all in detail later. There is a point to the various slides that are coming. They're going to fly through. I'm going to hand over the pointer to you because you want to flick through these. Oh, do I? Yep. Okay, perfect. Okay, so here's a program, um, and basically what we have is we have a counter here, which is just an int. We're going to count up, count down, right? And we're going to run multiple threads through this at the same time. So this is like completely thread unsafe. Um, of course, um, this is going to corrupt, but I have a local variable here that's going to count how many times each thread goes through, and at the end of it, I'll just add them all up. And we'll end up with a number at the end that says, OK, what's the throughput of this particular piece of code, right? With the understanding that you know, we're going to get the wrong answer. So if you don't mind your counters being a little bit inaccurate, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the kind of a 1 plus 1 equals 3 type situation. Oh, no, this, these, this these is... get a lot inaccurate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you would hope it was 0 at the end, but it's probably it's, not. No, it's yeah. going to be like, it's, it's, it's bad. 
Okay, so let's put this volatile keyword in here, right? Um, so what does the volatile do? Well, basically it says, don't cache. I can't cache this because, you know, um, it, the, you know that, that there's, there's going to be multiple threads accessing this particular piece of information, and so we just want to make sure that everybody, before they do anything with this particular variable, actually goes off and fetches what the current value is, right? Um, so the nice thing about the volatile is that we'll protect one operation, one atomic operation, uh, which is really cool if you're actually moving into the world of non-blocking or lockless concurrency. Um, but if you're trying to do stuff like this, um, you know, you're going to find that, okay, you know, these things are still going to corrupt, right? Because it doesn't protect both operations. Well, there's multiple operations going on in there, right? It looks like two, but there's actually a ton more. And then finally, we're going to say, okay, well, let's just like put full Java synchronization around here, right? And this is what I would call a, a very, very, very pessimistic uh, locking model, although necessary in this particular example, uh, because we're going to protect this, you know, with the idea that maybe possibly multiple threads are going to come through here and corrupt our counter. Well, okay, so we've set the conditions for that to happen this time, but, you know, in general, um, what we find is that the vast majority of threads or locks in your application are never contended for. As a matter of fact, um, in just recently I looked at about 40,000 stack traces from a single application. Don't ask me why. Um, and I found that there was only a very small handful of locks that could actually ever be contended for. All of the others were attached to local variables. And you would hope um, that they could be elited out of the code, but unfortunately Hotspot isn't quite powerful enough to actually make that determination and so they, they actually have to stay there. Uh, the only other comment I would say is that I, you know, is that to the hotspot guys is that we should automatically or automatically bias, use lock biasing uh, to bias the, uh, the, the lock to the thread that created that particular lock, the, uh, the object that, that, that's holding onto that lock because in this case, at least we could avoid the expensive operation of um, having to CAS to get the lease uh, for, the, for the lock. But for us Java Util concurrent fans, instead of using synchronize, we can use some explicit locks, maybe? Um, that's better, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot better, isn't it? Mm. Next. <laughs> okay, let's talk about this thing here. Now, this used to be better, and I need to try to explore um, why, but I just discovered last night, after rerunning an old benchmark, that all of a sudden, we get something that looks like this. <laughs> so here's your concurrency picture, right? So not thread safe. Um, that's essentially, you know, if we look at this unit list, we, you know, that's, that's how many times we can roll those leaps with the number of threads. By the time we put any time of type of concurrency control in there, there's our throughput. Youch. Isn't that sweet? Youch, youch, youch. And that's really nice. Right, so obviously, we can't use those. We somehow have to live with these things. Or do we? Perhaps not. So are people here familiar with the disruptor framework? Yeah, person at the front? <laughs> no surprises there. So the disruptor framework is a Java-based framework which is, uh, basically performs really highly transactional throughputs of trade transactions and other bits and pieces of data. And they get up to hundreds of thousands, millions, even reputedly tens of millions of transactions per second, right? And people go, how on earth are you doing that in Java? That it's absolutely impossible. And the answer is... They no, no, I get the answer for you, right? You know the old joke, right? That's right. It's like, doctor, doctor, it hurts when I do that. <laughs> so stop so, doing that. Then. So don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they don't use locks, right? They actually use lock-free algorithms to get around this problem. Right, okay. Challenge, virtualization. Who here is having to, who's here having to start doing virtualization for their production environment? How badly is it hurting you? <laughs> yeah, few, few, people are, few people are suffering. It's good for performance, right? Yeah? Because you're using your hardware better, right? Okay, maybe not. So, 
Why do we do it? We like to say we came up with this quote tonight. Why do we do it? Why do you do it? Why in do you the, virtualize? In the audience, why do you virtualize? Tell us, please. We want to know. It's, it's cheaper. cheaper. It's cheaper. Uh, for some definition of cheaper. It's, it's more, more manageable. manageable. Yes. Okay. Now we're talking. Now we're talking. It's elastic. It's elastic. Oh, man. Yeah. Hor that sort of comes into that manageability argument, yeah. right? Okay. Another horizontal scalability in. and all that sort of good stuff. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Another one is stepped into the trap. Well, Excellent. we're not going to go into too much depth about all the tons of variations of why, why you virtualize, but we will talk to the hardware story. Right? So some people mentioned we'll be able to use our hardware better. Yeah? Got all those CPUs sitting idle doing nothing. And those things are darn expensive. Has anyone tried to buy like the latest Ivy Bridge i7 lately? They're not I cheap. Do. Yeah, well. We, we, we clearly pay you too much. Terrible. <laughs> So, you don't pay me anything. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, have this, we have this idea that a lot of people think their hardware is currently underutilized. Right? So we should virtualize in order to utilize that hardware. But in reality, people aren't actually investigating why their hardware is being underutilized in the first place. It's, it's kind of very similar to the problem of, oh, I think we're using up too much memory, so I'll just go out and buy more hardware without exploring why you are using up all that memory. Well, it, it's, it's funny. I, mean, I was in a talk a couple of years ago, and somebody was looking at benchmarking in, in, a, um, in a virtualized environment. And he was saying, well, the performance is somewhat less, but I'm not exactly sure why. And he had a lot of nice little charts and little bits of data up there. And I just looked at it and said, OK, you know, I don't want to be disruptive to the talk, but if I wanted to be, I could put my hand up right there and say, I know exactly why, right? Um, you know, the system was um, bottlenecked on network. And it was very clear in the data that he was presenting that the system was bottlenecked on, on network, right? And the thing is, like, once you get a lot of these virtualized environment, you know, VMs running, and each of them are starting to aggr in aggregate, you know, chew up a lot of the bandwidth that you have on, on your box, um, all of a sudden, you know, everything is bottled on network. Now, you know, what do people do with this stuff? They add NAS. Oh, I'm going on a rant. Yeah, you're going on a rant. OK. Oh, uh, no, I'm going to rant. It's, it's tight. We, you know, we, we do they add NAS. Slide, it's network-attached storage device. And, and guess what? You just turned a disk I.O. problem into a networking problem on top of the networking problem that you already have. And then you start seeing your system times and, you know, climb to about you know, 20 30%. And then people are wondering, OK, you know, why do I have a performance uh, problem here? Um, so, oh, Trish is talking more about this tomorrow. What does Trish look like? Oh, she's over there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. So, what do we say for that? Right. You 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 can't virtualize yourself into more hardware. Yeah. If you're gonna, if you if you're going to run VMs on the hardware for manageability uh, uh, reasons, which I completely agree with, and there's acquisition costs and everything that that. Mm -hmm you know, that are good arguments to virtualize, then you need to make sure that when you build your virtualized environment, you actually supply enough hardware that you can actually feed this beast, right? And, and the, other, the other point is that it's, you know, our current problem is that we can't keep a CPU busy. Only under very rare conditions can we keep a CPU very busy, right? And, and virtualization is actually going to make that problem worse because the things that we're bottlenecked on that don't allow us to feed the beast, right? You're going to use more of them by adding more VMs on top of all this hardware. Plus, the VMs themselves take resources away from the applications that you're running. So I'm not advocating against virtualization. It's just like, just be aware of what you're stepping into when you actually step into that particular world. And part of that world is this very formal quote here, which we're actually going to skip past because we've got a simpler version of it, which is, as far as the hardware is concerned, it does not know about your process. It does not know about your thread. And quite frankly, it doesn't care. It, and it, it sort of knows about virtualization. A little bit these a days. A little bit these a days. A little bit yeah. these days. So it's getting smarter that way. Are we there? Yep. So right. as Kirk was ranting about before, there's a whole bunch of these things that you need to think about when you're talking about virtualization and adding VMs, more and more VMs, to your, your hardware. Right? You still, as we said at the very start, have got these finite hardware resources. See, it's about the hardware stupid. It's about, it's about the hardware stupid. Anyway. And we've seen situations where people have thrown 32 virtual machines on a 16-core box, for example. 
How is that ever going to work? I, I do not know, but they just magically think that, that some hardware will grow underneath them. Oh, we've, we've, we've seen worse than that, even without virtualization. <laughs> we've seen somebody launch uh, about 40,000 threads on a 64-way box, um, and um, that was basically delivering text messages. So if you're missing your text message, <laughs> we, we know who the we, vendor we is. We know who the culprit is. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you just have to be aware that when you're adding more virtual machines, you've got to be aware that they import in part their own cost in, in utilizing that, that only single piece of hardware you have. So plan, plan very, very carefully is, is basically what we're trying to say. And this is exactly what you need to do. Right? People here were saying it's cheaper. Is it really? Right? How many people actually do proper financial cost models to say, what is the total cost of ownership of owning a piece of virtualized hardware over six months, over a year, over two years? Okay, and, and not enough people do these study studies. Fine, well, I know my i7 was cheaper. Right. <laughs> so there's a few little tricks you can start to play these days. There's a, there's a CPU pinning trick where you can pin one of your virtual machines to a particular core to make sure that stuff doesn't swap around so much. That's why we should have talked about NUMA, because now we can explain why that works, right? Um, so that's basically you got when you got seconds. everything, what's that? You got 15 seconds. 15 Go. seconds. Um, <laughs> you have fast path, slow path to memory. Pinning a core <laughs> means that you're always on the uh, memory fast path, right? So you're able to feed the beast faster. Did I do that well enough? Perfect. Okay. So you have, other tr you have other tricks. You can actually pin virtual machines in some operating systems and some virtual managers. You can pin stuff to a, a bank of actual physical RAM, for example, so to make sure that you don't have two virtual machines fighting over memory. A whole bunch of little tricks you can, you can do. A lot of people are actually moving back to bare metal, we're finding. This has happened at three clients recently that we've dealt with. They started with virtualization, and they went all the way back. Right. So many reasons to move to the cloud. Performance isn't necessarily one of them. Did Definitely I say necessarily? I, I never say necessarily. <laughs> you will put that in to try to soften it. I did. I OK. Did. Um, so very quickly, because we're all, almost out of time. Oh, we've still got 10, 10 minutes or so, I think. OK, so we can, we can talk about every one of those, right? Wara? Wara. Yeah. Right, right once, run anywhere, yeah, or debug anywhere. Does anyone remember that awesome Sun marketing slogan? That's why right. you all became Java developers, right? <laughs> no? Yeah. Jim says yes. Yeah, Excellent. absolutely. I mean, so, OK, we're over the lie, because the, the operating system in, inflicts its characters into our processes so heavily that you, you can't paper over that uh, with any, any type of abstraction. Uh, although Java's done kind of like really good. It's done pretty good lately. The cost of a strong memory model? Oh, oh. We'll go through it. Is Brian in the room? Brian Gertz? No. No? Okay. OK. He's got a lot of work to do. OK. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, file system differences, display device, dif you know. You know. And, and we even have power source differences now. If you think about uh, mobile devices, of course, um, we don't have to worry too much about. Do, do we have any Android developers in the room, actually? People who code Androids, mobile devices? Mm. Not a single Android developer? There's one in the back corner. Yeah, there. one in the back. How, yeah, many, right. how many different types of devices and resolutions do you have to support? Millions, right? Yeah, there yeah. You so, go. awesome. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> people right. are wondering why they're starting to worry about Android. So, cost of strong memory model, JVM is ultra conservative. It needs to ensure correctness over everything else, and it's going to work to ensure correctness over anything else even if that means turtling along. And when it comes to um, you know, its memory model in terms of how it defines how different threads are able to communicate with each other, right? Um, it has to do something even more conservative than what most of the hardware platforms uh, will give you. Otherwise, you know, the memory model would be completely broken. So locks enforce correctness, but in a very pessimistic way, which is very expensive. Uh, locks delineate regions of serialization in our code, right? And, you know, serialization, which that feeds back into. Those laws and those graphs we showed you earlier on, right? Little's law, exactly. Have, have them pinned up next to your monitor. That's what we do in the office. Very exciting. No? OK, maybe not. <laughs> so um, unit of visibility on a CPU uh, is not equal to that in the JVM, right? Uh, the unit of visibility in a CPU is actually a cache line. Remember that first diagram I had with the block with the 64-byte grid thing, right? Right. So if you have, um, well, here, false sharing is an example of this visibility mismatch, right? So we have some sort of concurrency control on a single value, 
um, or two, two values in, in a cache, right? And one thread is accessing one and the other thread is accessing another. And then, and since that's happening in one core and this is happening in the other core, we actually have the cores telling each other that they have to flush to refresh uh, what's going on. Um, so, as a very quick ex explanation as a false yeah, sharing. So if you can imagine you've got two integers that you've declared in your class, right? And so they're sitting nice and tight next to each other. So one of those integers is declared as volatile, the other one is not. They both go into a cache line together, right? But the one who's got the volatile declared on it is forced back out into main memory. The other guy who was along for the ride in that cache line also gets evicted at the same time. So that's really kind of unfair, but that's, that's the mismatch we have today. Well, not only that, if somehow those val values get separated and they both needed to be protected, then all of a sudden the one that was along for the ride is no longer experiencing any accidental protection. Oh, Mark's brought us more beer, fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> this, three minutes, okay. Yeah, this, talk, this talk is gonna go even better now. Um, GC scalability, okay. Uh, well, what's the problem with GC scalability? Well, I think garbage collection is a bad term. I've always tried to view garbage collection as live object harvesting, because basically the cost of garbage collection is about, you know, all the, all the garbage collection cost models are about dealing with live objects. And the problem with larger heap sizes is that we, we have larger heap sizes because we're keeping more data, which means we have more objects, which means the cost for keeping these things uh, gets more and more expensive. Gets more and more expensive. It, it's now we have uh, G1 and Zing and Balance, right, uh, which are supposed to be the replacements to our current set of garbage collectors being, the, you know, they're, they're somewhat better at ignoring live objects, but they still have to deal with live objects. And that's what they deal with. So they, they have to find them, they have to mark them, they have to copy them, and they have to do all kinds of, all, all kinds of things with them. And, and that means as we go to larger and larger heap spaces, garbage collection is going to be a further and further drain uh, yeah. on performance. It's a common misconception. A lot of people think that garbage collection is about touching the dead stuff. It's actually about touching the live stuff. So it's yeah, just it a good, doesn't, good, a good garbage it. collector won't touch the dead stuff. Yeah, uh, that much. We're going to skip past GPU pretty quick because, quite frankly, it's not coming into Java until about Java 9. Nine. <laughs> right. So there is, a, there is a new project in play called uh, Sumatra that's trying to bring the GPU into play, right? So, uh, you know, the fact that, you know, the point here is that you thought you're going to get it like 1,024 cores in about 2023. Something like that. Um, right? No, that's not quite true. There's libraries you can download right now that will give you more than 800 cores on, on your machine right now um, if, you're, if you have a, like a brand new uh, laptop with a new, uh, new GPU unit in it. Yeah. Um, so we're gonna move to thou you know, basically thousands of cores a lot faster than we thought we were going to. So what can you do? If you're not using Java Util Concurrent today, do. <laughs> if you're not reading Brian's book yet, do. Um, if you're really, really serious about performance, you saw the graph earlier that Kirk showed where as soon as you put a lock in place, things dramatically decrease in terms of performance, so avoid locking algorithms. Cliff Click has got a fantastic library that you can use with Java 6 and up, so go and find that. That's really, really cool. You can work around G uh, garbage collection by putting stuff into main memory, into native memory, I should say, so you can map stuff using memcached, a whole bunch of other Hip startups are, are in this space as well at the moment. Yeah, the, the Twitter was actually working on doing a lot of putting a lot of their stuff into uh, C heap using these things called slab allocators. Mm -hmm. And I would say, beware. Um, if you go down that road too far, you're going to be writing your own garbage collector. Any Apache Cassandra people here? No? Good. Okay, we can defend them by saying that. That's right, fine. exactly. Um, um, help Brian out. Join, join the program to help work on OpenJDK itself because there's a ton of work to make Java and the JVM actually suitable for, for the modern hardware world that's coming up. It's actually um, a really serious threat, right? If you look at the way that cloud providers are providing their compute units, they're doing them almost all the way back to using the old forking approach, right? It's this tiny little process that gets split off every single time. They're, they're actually leaving the JVM behind. So, you know, we all need to help out. And we should mention Peter Lowry's Thread Affinity project because one of the things that Java currently doesn't do is give you good thread, thread affinity. It tries to do that in Hotspot, but you know, it, with mixed results. 
And um, you know, Peter's made some attempt at trying to make sure that uh, you know, the Java threads go back to the same core so they can you know, continue to use data in the same cache without having to wait to have the cache refreshed. Right. Um, and there's been some talk in the concurrency, in the concurrency threads saying, yeah, instead of, we should have, a, we have thread local right now, we should also have CPU local. That would be very cool. All right, we're gonna skip through the last very small section on the challenge of Java because we all actually wanna get out to the round tables and start ranting about our, about pieces in the Java ecosystem we don't like, which I believe is what's happening next. So we'll skip very quickly through that stuff and get to the conclusion, which is, we had too much to say. We had too much to say. <laughs> Not enough time to say it, eh? <laughs> Well, probably uh, too much time. Yeah. They want to get out of here now. So learn about your hardware again. And this has been said for year after year after year. But this time, seriously, guys, we are, we are not kidding, OK? Kirk said before, we're getting thousands of cores that are going to be arriving on your doorstep in a few weeks. Did you just click that through? Yeah, sorry. That's right. I like the dodo bird. OK. <laughs> it's kind of cool. Yeah. Don't become extinct, basically. So learn about the hardware. Help make the JVM better. Don't be the dodo be this next person. All right, you're gonna have to fight that Terminator because it's a cold, ruthless, calculating machine and it doesn't like you very much. We have some acknowledgements, people who helped us out with the talk in the last few days, so thank you very much to those people. And that's it, so enjoy ranting around the round tables and thank you for your time. And uh, we won't take any questions because... <laughs> we don't know the answers. We don't know the answers. <laughs> <laughs>